All right, welcome everyone back to chapter six. Here we are in section one, finally, the indefinite integral. And this is a second idea, so right? Um, something called the indefinite integral uh, is very good, closely related to the antiderivative. So we've been doing derivatives a lot. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about antiderivatives, which are gonna be uh, certainly related to the indefinite integral. Uh, and the claim is that antiderivatives or indefinite integrals are actually related to definite integrals, which are area under a curve, right? Or area between curves. So uh, let's see how that is. We're gonna do that next section. Right now, I just wanna introduce uh, what an antiderivative is or what a indefinite integral is. So capital F of X is an antiderivative of f of x if the derivative of capital F is equal to little f. So it's kind of what you would expect. It's not the derivative of little f, but it's kind of backwards, right? Actually, capital F has the derivative of little f. So that being said, find the antiderivative of f of x. So in this case, uh, we have 2x. So we're looking for something, some capital function f of x, that when I take the derivative of it, I get 2x. And so this takes a little bit of thinking and stuff, but hopefully we eventually agree that x squared, right, if you were to take its derivative, it would have the derivative of 2x, right? So this is an answer, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and just go ahead and highlight this. Do, 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 do. There we are, here's an antiderivative of little f, done. But interestingly enough, as I go on to mention, right, uh, antiderivatives are not unique, right? And they actually say, as we saw above. So there's more than one answer, right? So for instance, another answer would be capital F of X equals X squared plus one, or capital F of X is equal to X squared plus, you know, 93 or capital F of X is equal to X squared minus a million. Anything like this, right? So by adding a constant, remember the derivative of a constant is zero. So all of these have the same derivative. They all have the derivative of two X. So no matter what constant you add on there, it's still an antiderivative. So this little remark down here is just, right, they only differ by a constant, right? There are many different types of antiderivatives. Antiderivatives are not unique, right? Here we're four. There are infinitely many, in fact. Um, however, they only differ by a constant, right? So plus the one, plus the 93, minus a million, right? So they have a similar feel to them. And therefore, they get another definition where we're not so interested in the constant, right? In this case, we call this thing the indefinite integral. So the indefinite integral of f of x, which is denoted, so it's the very similar notation as the definite integral, except for we do not have a defined uh, interval, right? So we don't have this a to b, it's just the indefinite integral. There are no limits, there aren't these a's and b's floating around. So it's just the indefinite integral of f of x. This is defined to be the set of all antiderivatives of f of x. So in general, right, the derivative of capital F will be little f. Then we have the antiderivative, or sorry, the indefinite integral of f of x dx is equal to this antiderivative, capital F, plus any constant. So in order to know any constant, I'm just gonna do a C. And capital C here, this is so, any constant C, okay? And this is the set of all antiderivatives. Okay, let's actually do out a problem to practice this. So we're gonna evaluate the indefinite integral, six X squared plus one DX, right? So I'm looking for an antiderivative. Once I have that, I'm just gonna add a plus C to it to stand for any old constant, right? So, okay, I need something that when I take the derivative of it, I'm going to get six uh, X squared. So when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, okay, well, it probably has an X cube in it, right? Because if I have an X cubed, 
when I take the derivative of it, I'm going to get 6x. <laughs> wow. I said and wrote different things, and neither of them were correct. That's remarkable, right? <laughs> I was taking the derivative of this or something. All right, so when I take the derivative of x cubed, I get 3x squared, right? And this is very similar, right? Because we reduce the power by 1, so I know there's going to be an x cubed in there because I want an x squared. But I'll notice that my constants are off, right? I want 6, I have 3. So luckily, there's a constant multiple rule for derivatives that say, constants are along for the ride, right? So if I started with 2x cubed and took the derivative of it, then I would have 2 times 3x squared. And that is the same thing as 6x squared, right? I'm looking for an antiderivative. So this thing actually has the derivative 6x squared. All right, that's the first part. Second part, I would like something that has a derivative of 1. That's going to be, well, like x, right? And of course, we know that there's a nice sum rule for derivatives, so I'm just going to add these things together. So I want the derivative 6x squared plus 1. I should start with something like 2x cubed plus x. And then, because it's an indefinite integral, we want the set of, the set of all antiderivatives. So we're going to do plus any old c will work. And here is our final answer, 2x cubed plus x plus any c. Any constant will work. There we are. OK, so in general now, we want to make like a table and especially like a list of a bunch of antiderivative rules. So I'm going to start off with some relatively easy ones. This was going to help us with one of our big rules. So we've actually seen a few of these, right? We'd like to get antiderivatives uh, for the following functions. So x to the negative 3, x to the negative 2, x to the negative 1. This is like x to the 0, x to the first, x squared, x cubed. And so for all, for instance, we've already seen that the derivative of x is 1. We've seen something like this, right, where we actually saw the antiderivative of x, uh, well, of 2x was x squared. So I like this idea of starting with an x squared. But if I was to take the derivative of this, right, I would have uh, a 2 come down, right, and this would be 2x. So in order to fix that, in order to get just a 1 in front, I'm going to go ahead and think, well, I would like a half to cancel with that 2 when it comes down. And so because there's this constant multiple rule that one half, a constant, would just be along for the ride, I'm going to go ahead and put this in the antiderivative spot uh, up here. And now notice that this would cancel out perfectly, and I would just have x. So double check, right? If I take the derivative of 1 half x squared, I get x. Similarly, again, if I want x squared, right, I'm going to start with something like x cubed. But if I was to take the derivative of this, I would get a 3 out in front, right? The 3 would come down, and I would get x squared left. So in order to cancel that 3 when it eventually comes down, I'm going to use a 1 third, right? And of course, if I put a 1 third here, I should put it up here, right? Because again, we have a constant multiple rule. So if I take the derivative of this, now the 3 comes down, cancels with the 1 third perfectly, and so I'm left with just x squared. And hopefully you can see that there's a pattern to this. Right? So there's 1 over 2, 1 over 3. I'm going to guess that this is going to be 1 over 4, x to the fourth. So double check. If I take the derivative of this, let's see, the 4 would come down. 4 times 1 fourth times x cubed. And yes, the 4 and the 1 fourth perfectly cancel out, giving me just x cubed. So yes, this seems to be working. Now what about in this backwards direction? I want something that has the derivative of x to the negative 1. And the claim is, well, this is kind of hard, actually. But we've seen it before. Remember, x to the negative 1 is a way to represent 1 over x. 1 over x. So something that has the derivative of 1 over x. And again, we've seen this. It's the natural log. So if you take the derivative of the natural log, I guess the natural log of the absolute value, you get 1 over x. All right, so this is back uh, when we were taking derivatives very quickly in 4.5, right? We were taking derivatives of natural logs and things. OK, next one here. I want something that when I take the derivative of it, I get x to the negative 2. This is the same thing, of course, as 1 over x squared. So something that when I take the derivative of it, I get x to the negative 2. So I'm going to go back to this old idea, actually. So if I do x to the negative 1, then when I take the derivative of this, I'm going to reduce power by 1, and I would have x to the negative 2. But I have to remember that this exponent here, this negative 1, would come down. 
And so as of right now, I would have a negative 1. Ah, and I don't want that, right? So in order to fix this, I'm going to input my own negative 1. All right, so let me show you if I put a negative 1 here. Now when I take the derivative, right, the negative 1 will come down, cancel with this negative 1, right, because negative 1 times negative 1 is 1, right? And then I'm just getting x to the negative 2. Okay, and in fact, if you'd like to, if you want to follow this uh, format from before, right, you can actually write 1 over negative 1. We'll see why this is useful here in just one second in this final example. So again, if I want x to the negative 3, or this is the same thing as 1 over x cubed, right, I'm going to go ahead and start with x to the negative 2, right, because then when I take the derivative, this will come down and I'll reduce my power by 1, and so I'll get x to the negative 3. But the problem is that when I take that derivative, right, there would be this negative 2 here. Negative 2 would come down. So I'd like something to cancel with that negative 2. So actually, I'm going to use 1 over negative 2. So 1 over negative 2 will cancel with negative 2, just giving us 1. So of course, up here, using the constant multiple rule, I'm going to put 1 over negative 2. And you can see why this is kind of nice to write this one, because it kind of follows the pattern. Again, so these perfectly cancel out and just give you x to the negative 3. OK, so these all look pretty darn similar, except for uh, this one right here. This is kind of a special case all the other ones kind of follow a similar pattern. And so I'd like to write down some of the similar patterns that we find when we're taking antiderivatives. So these are rules of antiderivatives, and of course these are closely related with rules of indefinite integrals. Okay, so the first is the sum rule. Oops, yeah. The sum rule. So if you want the antiderivative of a sum of functions, this is the same thing as if you take the antiderivative of one function and then add it to the antiderivative of a second function, g of x. Likewise, differences work out as well. So f of x dx, the antiderivative here, or the indefinite integral, minus the indefinite integral of g of x dx. Right? And this just comes down to, if you wanted to actually prove this, right? it is a theorem, there is a proof behind these things, it just comes down to these were properties of derivatives. So of course they're going to be properties of antiderivatives, even if it's the set of all of them. Constant multiple rule also exists for antiderivatives that you can go ahead and just factor out constants, that they're just along for the ride. So you get something like this, just take the constant out, that's it. And now here's the first one where I really want to use kind of this table up here, the power rule. So if you have something x to the n, and you'd like to find the indefinite integral for this. Well, notice up here in most of the cases, right? Like, so this was x to the 0, here's x to the first, here's x squared, here's x cubed, right? So it seems like what you're doing in order to go in this direction is that you're adding 1 to your exponent, which kind of makes sense because before you were subtracting 1. So this would be x to the n plus 1, antiderivative. So right, derivatives, you would subtract 1. Antiderivatives, you're going to add 1. Kind of makes sense. And then there's a little coefficient, right? And this seems to be always 1 over the power. So the new power is n plus 1, so 1 over n plus 1. And of course, this is going to be uh, an indefinite integral, the set of all antiderivatives, so therefore we're adding this plus c here. Now this works in most of the cases, right? Even here in this zero case, x to the zero, you add one to the exponent, so this would become x to the first, and then you would divide one over n plus one. So in this case my n is zero, so one over zero plus one is one. Okay, so this actually works here. The only case that it doesn't work out is in this natural log case when you're dividing by zero, right? Because if I was to try to apply this rule, maybe I'll use it in red or something like this. If I was trying to apply this rule here, really I don't leave any room for myself, I guess up here. The antiderivative, or the indefinite integral, sorry, of x to the negative one dx. If I was to just try to follow that rule, I would want to add one to my exponent Right, so n plus 1, so this is going to be x to the negative 1 plus 1, so that's x to the 0, times 1 over n, which again was negative 1 plus 1. 
So here you can see you'd be dividing by zero and that's bad. So actually this is the only case where we need to have a special rule and that's saying that for this rule to actually work we need to make sure that n is not equal to negative one. So if n is not equal to negative one, actually this holds true even for other negative values like you see here. When you have x to the negative three, you add one to it, so you get x to the negative two, and then you divide by that new exponent, right? So the new exponent was negative two, you divide by that. So that's dividing by this uh, n plus one. Okay, so in that special case, when you have this x to the negative first power, as we've seen before, this actually deserves its own separate rule, right? So this is actually going to be the natural log of the absolute value of x, again, plus any constant, because it's an indefinite integral. It's the set of all antiderivatives. Okay, likewise, we've already seen derivatives of other things. For instance, e to the x uh, can have its own rule as well. We saw that the derivative of e to the x was just itself, so it makes sense that the antiderivative of e to the x is just itself. So here's a nice rule. And in general, we know how to take derivatives of uh, general exponents, right? So b to the x. So if you wanted to go the other way, if you wanted to take the antiderivative or the set of all antiderivatives, aka the indefinite integral, well, this is going to look like b to the x divided by the natural log of b, right? Because it's, again, the antiderivative. Uh, remember, the derivative, this would be times the natural log of b. But because it's the antiderivative, it's divided by and plus c because it's, again, the set of all antiderivatives aka the indefinite integral. And then finally, we know that absolute values are a little bit tricky. So this is kind of a, a bonus one right here. The claim is that the antiderivative or the set of all antiderivatives, aka the indefinite integral is going to be x times the absolute value of x over two plus c. So this is a nice rule. We'll see how this is applied a couple times. Okay, let's try some out. First of all, example, evaluate out the indefinite integral of the square root of u du. So right, we're integrating with respect to u here. Well, this is important. We need to remember that this is the same thing as u to the 1 half du. And so as I look at all of these different rules that I now have, the claim is that the one that makes the most sense, the one that I want to apply, is this power rule right here, right? Because n is equal to 1 half. We're raising it to the 1 half power. 1 half isn't equal to negative 1. So I can go ahead and use it. So this isn't just integers, it's any old power. So, okay, let's do it. So the rule says that we should add one to the exponent. So instead of one half, it's going to be three halves. And then we're gonna divide by that new exponent. So one divided by three halves plus C, right? Because it's the set of all antiderivatives. And of course, if you wanted to simplify this a little bit, right, instead of dividing by fractions, it's okay to multiply by the reciprocal. So this is gonna be 2 thirds u to the 3 halves plus c. And of course, if you wanna check your work, just take the derivative of this thing, right? So if I take the derivative, the 3 halves is gonna come down. The 3 halves cancels perfectly with the 2 thirds. I reduce my power by one. So instead of 3 halves, it would be 1 half and the derivative of a constant is just zero. So again, these perfectly cancel out, and I just have u to the one half, which is of course what I started with, right? Because antiderivatives and derivatives, kind of if you apply one of each, you should get back to where you started. So this is a slick way that you can check your work. So here we are, this is the final answer. Over here, this was just the check. Okay, let's do a little bit more complicated one. Here we are, in this case we have a whole string of functions, right? Comboed together with addition and subtraction and all that sort of stuff. So we're gonna be using these sums and differences rules which just say, well, do them all one at a time, right? So, okay, let's do each one one at a time. So x to the 10th, I'm gonna go ahead and use uh, the power rule, which says that I should add one to my exponent and then divide by the new exponent. So add one to it, I get 11, divide by the new exponent, done. Okay, ah, this three over x, this looks a lot like, right, my x to the negative first rule, because of course, x to the negative first is the same thing as one over x. So, but the thing is that it has this extra three with it, but luckily there's a constant multiple rule, 
right, which says the three is just along for the ride. So the three is along for the ride, and if you want the indefinite integral of one over x, this is gonna be the natural log of the absolute value of x. Okay, if you want the indefinite integral of two to the x, well, this is going to be this general exponential rule right here, b to the x. So I'm gonna do this with my b equaling two. So b equals two, so this is gonna be two to the x divided by the natural log of two. Okay, oops. And again, we have negative six absolute value of x. So if I want the antiderivative of this, or the set of all antiderivatives, aka the indefinite integral, right, I'm gonna use this absolute value rule. Right, so the absolute value rule. Again, this negative six is a constant, right? It's along for the ride. So negative six is along for the ride. And if I take the antiderivative, I get x times the absolute value of x over two. And all of these rates should have a plus some constant, right? Because this is again, the set of all antiderivatives. And so I can do one more line to simplify down. Really, there's not that much to simplify plus three natural log of the absolute value of x, plus two to the x over the natural log of two, minus three x absolute value of x plus c. And again, if you wanted to check this, if you wanted to verify that you didn't make any mistakes, of course right now we have those formulas just written right above here, uh, but if this was on a quiz or an exam, and if you didn't have these formulas, right, the way that you would check is just by taking the derivative of your answer. And if you're doing things correctly, when you take the derivative of your answer, you should get back to where you started. All right. Well, that is the end for this section. Thank you very much. I'll see you guys in a little bit.